been to an amazing chapter. We're going to continue our study in the book of Acts. Um, we're in that slow process of the book right now. Once we're through all of this stuff, we'll pick up the pace. I know that's hard to imagine, but that really will happen once we get all past the chapter 1 and 2 because there's just so much there that we need to understand because this is going to be the basis for, for the way that the book of Acts is going to sort of play out in the future. And so you need to have all of these things understood before you move on. So as we move to the book of Acts, remember it's the message of God, and the message of God is in fact the resurrected. It's, it's the resurrected Christ. Now, in chapter 2, we're not going to get there this morning, but what we're going to see is Peter's first message under the power and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is going to be focused on the resurrection. Because this is going to be the thing that is going to cause these guys to be able to hold on to something in spite of all of the hostility and the conflict that was going to be confronting them as it confronts us. So, so these things are very important for us to understand. Now we spent chapter 1, we looked at all of this, we saw where Jesus there um, set apart uh, the, the, the apostles, that he told them that what they were going to do was they were going to represent him and they were going to start in Jerusalem, remember? And then they were going to expand out to, G to Judea and then they were going to expand out into Samaria and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. Okay? But before that all happens, God is going to bring all of those folks in to Jerusalem because there's a celebration that's happening. Now what we've been talking about was that was the 40 days after the resurrection that all of these things and those instructions from Jesus were given to these guys. Okay? And then we said at that 40th day, which we talked about last week, was when he ascended and returned to the Father's house where he currently is preparing a place for us in the Father's house, not this earth. He's preparing a place for us in the Father's house that He promised He would come back and take us to where He is. But He's also functioning as our advocate, as the one who, who pleads our case on our behalf uh, against, uh, against all of those that would accuse us. In particular, obviously, our great enemy, Lucifer himself. So that's what's happened in chapter 1. Okay? So Jesus, they've watched him go up into the heavens. They're all sitting there with their mouths agape. And then the angels appear and said, hey, stop staring at the dang clouds. Get ready because he's already told you what's going to happen. So they return to the city of Jerusalem. Okay? This is where we pick up now chapter 2. In verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had finally come. Okay? There it is. The day of Pentecost. Penta, 50. The 50th day. When the 50th day had finally come, Luke tells us. Now we've looked at and we're going to spend some time looking at these things again this morning to remind ourselves that everything that was happening here had already been preordained by God, had been established, and had been given symbols to show how all of this would happen. This should have taken no one by surprise. And it didn't ultimately. Initially they were a bit confused, but later they would work through this. So when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now remember, chapter 2 is, is a continuation of chapter 1. So they had been in the upper room with Jesus. They went down to the Mount of Olives. They watched him go up after, uh, after the great uh, the, the commission to go into Jerusalem and all the way out into the uttermost parts of the earth. Then they returned to Jerusalem into the upper room where they had been in one accord. Remember, in prayer and stuff. And this is where all of this, uh, the uh, selection of Matthias had taken place. And we talk, stuff we talked about last week. So they're back in this place. And notice once again that they're in one accord. There's an agreement. There's a unity here that's taking place. At this point, there are no denominational differences. There are no, uh, no aspects that have crept into this at this point into the church to cause any massive problems, which is going to happen just a few, very few short years after this. So and suddenly, as they're all in one accord in one place, that is that upper room again, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing, <clears throat> as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Now remember, this was a big enough room that we believe that there was probably roughly 120 individuals that were gathered together in this place. Now the 12 were the specific, the apostles, we talked about that, one specifically set. So they were unique to everyone else and yet part of the larger group. Okay, the disciples. So that's what's taking place. So as they're in this room in one accord, all of a sudden there's a sound that comes from heaven and this wind rushes through the building. 
And we just had this the other day, like Katie was talking about. And when these storms come in, isn't it awesome how those storms, I love that, there's always that big wind. I just love that. I don't know about you guys. I just think it's really cool. It makes a mess of things, but it's, but it's really cool to hear that wind and all of a sudden there's that lightning and there's that thunder because that's exactly what was taking place here. Now, they would have immediately known the day that it was and their minds would have been back several thousand years to another time when this same incident took place. On a day when Moses and, uh, and Aaron and, uh, uh, and Moses' sons went up on top of the mountain 50 days after they left after they left Egypt where they had come to Mount Sinai the same thing had happened and that was the day as a matter of fact that Pentecost was established that God told them what was taking place here and then later they would be they would be instructed to remember that year after year throughout its generations forever so that day that they celebrated at Sinai Mount Sinai is now being duplicated in Mount Zion where Jerusalem is. That's what's going on here. So there's this sound, of, notice it comes from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and that's because there really was one that was the wind that was there. It was the Holy Spirit that was coming on this. And it filled the whole house while they were sitting. So this is not just a, a normal wind that just sort of blows through a breezeway. This is something that actually filled the entirety of the room. And then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. So there was accompanying the wind and all of the other stuff that was going on. There were these things that appeared to be fire that showed up. And it split and it went. And notice, as it, and it sat upon each one of them. This is where we get the tongues of fire. Now, that's the English translation. All it literally says is that there was a fire that came and it divided itself up and it came to rest upon each of them. Now, this is very obviously symbolic and we're going to look at that here in a few minutes because that's the exact same thing that happened in Mount Sinai. We're going to see in a few minutes. And God descended upon the mountain after calling Moses and, uh, and Aaron up to the mountain and God descended and God descended in a fire. Imagine that. There's always this, this aspect of purity that comes with fire because that's what fire symbolizes in the scripture. The presence and the purity of God. The Shekinah glory, remember? As God led his people of e out of Egypt across the wilderness. In the daytime, it was a pillar of smoke. and At night, it was a pillar of what? It was a pillar of fire. Well, and lo and behold, even before Moses, about 400 years before Moses, we learned on our Wednesday nights that there was another time that fire and smoke were showed up. And this was the time when God put Abraham into a coma, for lack of a better term, although Abraham knew clearly what was going on, and God entered into the Abrahamic covenant. Not with Abraham, but in sight of Abraham. And what Abraham saw literally was a burning pot in an oven. What he saw was smoke and fire. Once again, the presence of the Lord, which we call the Shekinah glory. Anytime God appears in the scripture, it's there and then later on the tabernacle and uh, we saw God led the people in the, with the Shekinah glory, with the cloud at, night, at day and the fire at night and then it's going to sit on the tabernacle once the tabernacle is there and God, the presence of God is always viewed as that. So what's happening here is the presence of God is filling the room. Now if you don't think that would cause you to sit back a little bit and go, whoa, then I don't know what it would. Because they're not quite understanding yet what is happening. All they know is that what took place on this day during the days of Moses. But this is something that's new. There's something that's, that's distinct about what's taking place here that is different than what happened in the old. And there certainly is because there's a change that's taking place. We're moving from law to grace. We're moving from old covenant to new covenant. That's what's taking place here. Now, they were a little slow to catch on to this, but we can't blame them because we would have been just as slow. In fact, we're pretty slow to mend it today, and we've had 2,000 years to study the dang stuff. So this is all of the things that are going on here. But all of a sudden, now imagine this. You've just been out there on the Mount of Olives. You've watched the Lord descend. You've been freaking out over that. And the angel said, hey, go and do what he's asked you to do. It's like, well, okay. So you go back to the house. And just in the house, you're all talking about that. Did you see that man? Did you see him go up into the heaven? Yeah, you, know, you, can, you can imagine what was going on. And then all of a sudden, right? <laughs> I'm doing the sound effects for the kids. Try to, keep, try, to keep, try to keep them engaged. But you can just imagine this wind that just begins to blow. 
Now, if this, this is a day that you, can you imagine? I'm sorry, this was 10 days later. Sorry, I messed up. They were talking about it for 10 days. Now the 10th day, now the wind is blown. But you got to know they're still talking about all this, right? Can you just imagine what this must have been like? We read this and we think, oh, how wonderful. Oh, they were all gathered in the upper room and the wind started to blow and oh, there was all of these things and oh, and these neat little fire, tongues of fire. We saw, seen the pictures, right? You've seen the pictures of the paintings and stuff and there's these little tongues of fire and they're all sitting around and they're all like this. You really think that's what happened? Is that the way you would have been sitting around? You would have been going... That's what you'd have been doing, man. We'd all been doing that, going, dude, don't move. There's fire on your head. That's what we'd have been saying. Don't move. We, we would have been freaking out. This, this, it's hard to imagine what this must have been like. And we, as Denny often tells us, we Sunday school it down. What a tragedy. Put yourself in the midst of all of these events that are taking place. And man, this has been a humdinger 50 days, man. Everything that you thought you understood has been ripped away. And it's all been shaken and it's been stirred. Shaken, not stirred. <laughs> it's been shaken and stirred. And all you don't know what's going on here. And then all of a sudden this takes place. I, I can't even imagine. But they knew, at least they knew, what day it was. That's why Luke says, when Pentecost had finally come. I love that he says, when it had finally come. They knew, at least to some degree, they had been anticipating what the Lord would do on the day of Pentecost. And that's where I really want to talk about. Now this is where the charts come in. And this is, I know, no fun for a lot of you guys. But I'm trying to get you to understand this. And to really see what's taking place here. Because I'll be honest with you as I can possibly be. As pastors, we have butchered this. We have made it such an event like we just talked about, a Sunday school picture, Graham, that, that it, was, it has just taken the life out of what really took place there. Oh yeah, we know it was the birth of the church. We know that these people were all of a sudden given an ability to do something that they were never able to do before, speak all these different languages. This is, we know all of those things and it's all wonderful and it's all this, but we just sort of dummy it down and it's a tragedy because there's so much happening here. So we need to tie it back in because Luke saying that it had finally come meant that they were anticipating it. That's the implication that's here. Why? Because they understood that Jesus had been crucified on Passover. He had been buried on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And He had resurrected on the first fruits, on the day of first fruits. They understood these things. They didn't quite know what they meant, but they got it. They were starting to get it. So logically, for them as a Jew, because this is what Moses had taught them, what they were doing is they were saying, Oh man, at the resurrection, we got to start counting 50 days now, because Pentecost is coming. And so they said, wow, if he's done all of this on Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits, what's going to happen on Pentecost? Can you just imagine this? For thousands of years, literally thousands of years, these people had celebrated these days without understanding what they were. They had turned them into festivities and celebrations. And they were times of festivity and celebration. But they had missed the point. How do we know? Look at the nation today. We just celebrated, or they would have just celebrated Pentecost just a couple of weeks ago. And yet, did you hear anything about it? And it was so significant to them, even as Jews, these days and the days of Jesus, and those days and the days of Jesus, but even today it's like, yeah, well, whatever, you know. Uh, the Passover, yeah, we celebrate the Passover. And you know, how many Jews people I've, I've talked to that said, well, you know, I really don't practice Judaism, but I do go and, and try to observe Passover. It's like, well, why? I mean, if, if you're not going to do the rest, what the point? what's the point? And then Passover for them is, not, is no longer the Passover. It's unleavened bread because unleavened bread was seven days feasting. So they like the seven days thing. So now the feast is not even called Passover anymore. They still call it that. But for the, for the general population, it's understood as the unleavened bread because there's seven days of celebration. It's, it's, it's just, it's mind-boggling. And the church has failed to explain why these things are so significant. So we saw that the first fruits, the 17th of Nisan, that's when Christ was resurrected. He has become, Paul said, our first fruits. The first of the harvest that God had promised. 
And then they would begin counting from that day 50 days. In fact, there would be seven weeks. And for them, they call it the Feast of Weeks. That's what they call it. Shavuot. That's what it means. It means the celebration of weeks. They were, they were to count off seven weeks, which would be 49 days. And then on the 50th day, they were to have the celebration of the Pentecost. So this is the period of time when all of this is taking place. And it's during the first 40 days of that 50 days of counting, which we just talked about, where Jesus appeared and did all sorts of ministry, some that's not even recorded for us, in Jerusalem, in Galilee, in Bethany, and then, like we said from last week, back in Jerusalem before his ascension. That's what Acts chapter 1, verses 4 to 11 are all about. 12 through the end of the chapter are those guys bringing in Matthias and explaining what happened with Judas and so on and so forth. But that's where those verses come. But Luke has just told us the day of Pentecost had finally come. You see, that's 10 days later. That's what makes it Penta. We call it Pentecost because we're Gentiles, we're not Jews. Again, for them, Shavuot, which is the Feast of Weeks. For us, it's Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection. A special day which we're going to be getting into. It's going to take us a few, day, few Sundays to get through the actual, uh, everything that occurred here uh, during this period of time. But ten days later, the Holy Spirit descends. Jesus ascends in Acts chapter 1, and ten days later, the Holy Spirit comes down. We just read that. He showed up in wind and fire. Remember that? The very presence of God in the midst of His people. Okay? And of course, this is what we called um, Pentecost. That's on their month called Sivan. It's the middle of our May to the middle of our June. Okay? That's when this all took place. Well, what happened that day? The church was born. There was no such thing as a church prior to this day. They were still under law until that 50th day after first fruits, 2,000 years ago. And what a tragedy for those that want to continue under the law today. How sad it is. When we, when we lived in Belize, uh, I, I've shared this to, to some degree, one of the things that happened when we got there, there uh, uh, in, in 98, some religions had, had, had gotten into Belize and had brought with it this, this idea of Sabbath. Okay, uh, and and this uh, uh, you know this idea of circumcision and all of these things. In other words, that you had to obey the law. And I used to have all sorts of discussions with these people all the time because they were always trying to convince you uh, that that their particular persuasion of understanding of the scripture was correct. And and several times, and I'm I'm not saying this to say ooh ah uh, you know ooh Rick way to go wow ah, Rick, but but it was interesting because they would say to me things like that, and they would say oh. So you're a Christian, you know, and I said, well, yeah, I am. And they said, and so you celebrate the church on Sunday? And I said, yeah. And they said, well, if you find one place in the scripture where it says to, have to, to worship God on Sunday, then we'll worship God on Sunday. I said, you show me one place where it says to worship on Saturday, and I'll worship them on Saturday. <laughs> They're like, oh, oh, and they start flipping through their Bible saying the Sabbath. I said, it says nothing about worship on the Sabbath. Worship was the rest of the week. Sabbath was the day of rest. The Sabbath was when you were in your home. You went to the church, you heard the synagogue, you heard a couple of things, but you went to home and you rested with your family. You talked about the things of God. The worship of God was during the rest of the week, not on the Sabbath. Okay? I mean, if that's true, then what happened to those people that lived outside of Jerusalem? Or lived more than a Sabbath day's journey from wherever the synagogue was? What, what, what would those people do? You see, it doesn't even make sense when you think about that. And they were like, oh... And I said, let me ask you this. You want to stick with this thing? Now, please understand where I'm going. We just talked about this on Wednesday night. And they said, oh yeah, well, it's still, it's still the law. And I said, really? Well, let me ask you this. Are you guys circumcised? Uh, well, yeah, exactly. That's what I thought. And how far did you travel on Sabbath to get to your church service? Oh, well, we drove a couple of miles. Well, then you broke the Sabbath there as well. So you see, don't you be a bit hypocritical here? Maybe you should look in the mirror before you start pointing the finger at other people. But this was, the, this was the difficulty that was taking place here. If you don't understand all of these things, you can be led astray. And what happens when you start making the law and circumcision and observance of the Sabbath and all of these things, and you start heaping these on people, then what you end up doing is you end up recognizing religion, and religion always puts people in bondage. Always! Again, Wednesday night we were talking about this. 
Because there's this view to want to look at what, what Abraham, what God had Abraham do with circumcision way back there in Genesis chapter 17. And, then, and there's this, this deal to try to make it this religion that, that even the conversation was about that. But it's never been about religion. It's about relationship. There were many that were circumcised under the Abrahamic covenant and yet lived completely contrary to the law of God. So circumcision did these people no good. See, we could go on and on, but you get the idea. So we need to be careful because it was heartbreaking to see these Belizeans and other people, even in America, that live every day of the week in absolute fear that if they fail to do one of these things, God is just going to say, I knew it, boom, and just swat them like a fly. This view that God sits in heaven just waiting for you to mess up so he can nail you. Take your children away through a sickness. Cause you to lose your job and your home. Do you know how many people view that? Why is God doing this to me? What? God doesn't do things like that. Now can He? Of course He's God. And He's done it in the past. But that's not the way God does things. Typically when those things happen to us, if we're really honest with it, it goes right back to our own dumb choices that put us in those predicaments to begin with. Our problems in this life primarily are self-inflicted. Even disease itself is self-inflicted. Man brought this upon himself. Why do we continuously blame God? If God is love, how can it... Uh, shut up. God is love. The reason you have these problems is because, is because you live in a world that rejected that love, in a world that continues to reject that love. In a country that keeps wanting to set God aside in favor of, nonetheless, religion. Freedom of religion. What is freedom of religion? Can you really be free in religion? Ah, you can, can you? Because rigid, well, is religion. You can, you can't, you should, you shouldn't. You know, you have to, you might. <laughs> you get the idea. That's what religion is. The problem with religion, as we've said a million times, is you can always find somebody that's worse off than you are. That's why religion is comfortable to man. Because I'm three rungs up on the ladder. That Kinney's only made two. So I'm, I'm better shaped than Kinney is. See, that's what religion does. It always does that. Well, I'm more this. I'm more faithful to pray. I'm more faithful to the scripture. I'm more faithful to come to church. I'm more faithful in these things. Blah, 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 blah. Where does it say that? <laughs> it doesn't say that. Those things are the natural byproduct of a person who doesn't religiously have a relationship with the Lord, but relationally or intimately has a relationship with the Lord. Those things are natural. It's the natural outflow. You want to be in fellowship. You want to study His Word. You want to pray. You want to worship. You want to serve in places like Vegas and Colorado City and all of these other places. You want to do those things. Because the motive is love, not religion. Not so that you can get your gold star up in heaven by your name. And tragically, that's how most of us live. Now, we're going to go through this really quickly because I, I just wanted to show you this one more time before we actually get into what, what's taking place here. Now remember, the 14th of Nisan was Passover 15th. Okay, this is their names, the first fruits and stuff like that. But here's the thing. They were all fulfilled in the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, remember, when we say the feasts of Israel, the word feast is actually the Hebrew Moedim. And Moedim means appointed times. These are times that God appointed. And in each case, He said they're to la go from generation to generation. They are an everlasting observance. You're supposed to always remember these things. So what God established way back there in Leviticus chapter 23 is still playing out today. So why then are we not, as the church, trying to understand these things? It's sad. But those first three... Those were done in the spring, March to April, for us, for them, the month of Nisan, that's our Mar March to April. They were all fulfilled in that first coming of Christ. They were the death, the burial, and the resurrection. In other words, the gospel, as Paul identifies it in 1 Corinthians 15. Christ has redeemed. That was our study in the Gospel of Luke. Now we talked about from first fruits, there's that 50 days later, which is the day we're focused on, which is Pentecost. That too was fulfilled. 
This was not fulfilled by the, those other three. This was fulfilled with the ascension of Christ. The Holy Spirit descends, the church begins, and I believe, personally, that it will end when the Holy Spirit ascends and the church's role has been finished. Romans 9, 10, and 11, and 1 Thessalonians 4, and we can go on and on and on. Okay? 1 Corinthians 15, blah, 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 blah. You get the idea. Okay? But that means that there are three yet to go. The fall feasts. And yes, there are. Jesus did not fulfill them, but He will when He comes back. There's trumpets yet to go. And this is the, well, you can see, um, the, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and then Tabernacles, Sukkot. These have not been fulfilled. They will be fulfilled when the Lord returns. Okay? And that trumpet is going to initiate all of that as Jesus returns. Now, for those of you that are really into this, I just thought I'd be clever and throw this in. But if you remember, Daniel, prophecy, Daniel chapter 9, Daniel's first 69 weeks ended on Passover. Then there was a break. There's a gap for you and I. It's now been right around 2,000 years. As we approach that, Daniel's 70th week is right there. Okay? The church, though, is, is from, from the Scripture, is, is not there. So that's what's going on. But here now, this is Exodus. This is when it first happened. I want to read this for you guys because I just think it's phenomenal. And when we see this, and I would, ch I would challenge you to read this whole uh, encounter. Actually, it starts in around chapter 19. Uh, and, it, and it actually moves forward through, through about chapter 24. And you've got to pay a lot of attention because there's a lot of stuff that's going on there. But most of it happened in one day. Okay, So you've got to keep that in mind of, of what's taking place there. But this is when it, became, when it happened. Now let me set the stage here just a little bit. God had sent Moses to Pharaoh who had kept the people of God in bondage. The message being, let my people go, that they may worship me. Now we all know the story. He wouldn't do it, he refused. We always say, well why did God harden his heart? If you read the passage carefully, Pharaoh hardened his own heart, and when God said, okay dude, you want a hard heart, here you go. And then God ended up hardening it to the point where he wouldn't even respond. So now it's on. There's a showdown between the people of Egypt and their god, Pharaoh, because pharaohs were gods, hence the, the, uh, uh, the uh, pyramids and their journey into heaven and all that stuff. They were supposed to be gods on the earth, okay? Plus the other pantheon of gods, the sun, the moon, the snakes, the beetles, the cows, the frogs, the flies, the dirt, the Nile. Hmm, yeah, that's right. This initiated the conflict between Pharaoh as God of Egypt and his people against Israel and the God of Israel. This was a conflict between the gods of Egypt and the God of Israel. Obviously the God of Israel won. <laughs> because he is God. All that stuff that happened, the, the, uh, the, 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 the gnats, the dirt, the sun, the animals, the Nile, the frogs, the flies, all of those were worshipped by the Egyptians as gods. Every single one of them. And God said, well, we're going to find out here about this. But you're going to let my people go. And of course, the last was the God of life. And when, when Pharaoh threatened to, to kill the firstborn, that's when Moses said, okay, that's it. God said, enough. We'll see. So the firstborn. This led to the Passover, right? The judgment would come on those people that would worship their gods other than the God of creation, or the God of Israel in this case. And God said, I personally will deal with this issue. And he came down, and what we know, and he, he called the death angel, and he slaughtered all of those that were not under the blood. Now, everybody had an opportunity to be under the blood. Pharaoh himself could have been under the blood that night, had he chosen to do so. Obviously, he's not going to choose that. But for those that did, the judgment of God and the angel of death passed over. That's where the Passover comes from. Okay? Now for you and I as a Christian, that's the significance of Passover. For the Jew, the significance of Passover is their release from Egypt. Do you see the difference? It's huge. 
This is why there's conflict and confusion over all this. But we know that what that was is a symbol that Israel, shoot, Egypt, with its gods and its leader was the picture of sin in bondage and tyranny over the people of God. But God delivered them. And He delivered them in judgment by protecting them, by placing them under the blood. Okay? When that happened, the Egyptians woke to find the big problem with the death of all the firstborn, and even the Jews that wouldn't have done that, suffered the same loss. And the Egyptians begged them to go. So that started the next day, but God had already told Moses to prepare for that day, the very next day, because that day you're going to have to eat in haste because you're going to have to beat feet out of Egypt. We called it the Exodus, the first day of unleavened bread. Bread without leaven, didn't have time to rise. Bitter herbs, no time to cook, make anything nice. All of that stuff. And then be on your way. So God sets them free. Okay, They enter that. The third day of that, God would later tell them, is to be recognized as first fruits. They had stopped in the desert and worshipped God three days out. First fruits. From that day, 50 days later, or actually 47 days later, they find themselves at Mount, Mar I'm, I'm, uh, Mount Sinai. Okay? 47 days. That's where we are. Moses has led the people across the wilderness with all the stuff that took place there, which we're going to look at probably next week a little more in detail, but not today. So the Exodus, the people have been set free. They have gone from Egypt now and across. They have crossed over and now they're at Mount Sinai. On the 47th day, God says, Now, tell the people, He speaks to Moses, tell the people to consecrate themselves. Because on the third day, I will come down upon the mountain to meet with you. Gosh, there's a lot of similarities, isn't there? Third day, God coming down, meeting with His people, going up. Hmm, imagine that. How we miss this is beyond me, but we do. So that's the stage is set. So Moses tells, here's what God wants you guys to do. Okay? And, he's, and uh, uh, so the people are like, okay, whatever God says, we're going to do it. <laughs> yeah, heard that before, haven't we? Yeah, I say it all the time. Now, verse 16. This is where it picks up in Exodus. Then it came to pass on the third day, notice, in the morning that there were thunderings and lightning. So the third day, the people have consecrated themselves. They've all come to the mountain now to, to watch God. The God of Israel that, that speaks through one of their own. And God had said, listen, tell them to stay back. Tell them not to come too close to this thing. Remember, this is under law, not grace. Okay? If, if you unholy enter into holiness, you cannot survive the encounter. That's what God was doing. He was protecting them. Okay? He said, tell them to stay back. Stay back away from the mountain. Don't come up. But you, to come to this point, then you come up because you and I have a relationship. And because we have that relationship, I'm going to meet you on the mountain. That's what's happening. So the people and stuff, they all come to the mountain in the morning on that third day after consecrating themselves. And there goes Moses up the mountain. And that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of notice, the trumpet. I'm going to point this out. I'll touch on it this week. Probably get to it more next week. This idea of the trump of God that Paul was talking about and trying to tie that into a, the, the shofar or even the tabernacle to, um, a trumpets and stuff is absolutely bogus. Nobody made these trumpets. They're blowing from heaven. This is the trump of God. It's the only other recurrence of this in the scripture except when Paul says, at the last day on with the trump of God. It's not the trump of the priests. It's not the, prump, uh, the trumps of the tabernacle or of the temple or of anything else. It's the trump of God. This trumpet is unique, as will be the one that Paul talks about. There isn't anything like them. They're coming from heaven, for goodness sake. Okay? So it's different. You can't tie the two together, even though we try. So there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain, and the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Does that sound like a couple of bearded priests going fuh, fuh, to you? Please. We want to talk about this and we say, well, this was the priests blowing the 99 trumpets on the Feast of Trumpets and stuff like that. Well, they, these boys must have had some lungs because these guys are freaking out the whole camp. Now, we know that there was roughly 600,000 at least men that left 40 days ago, 50 days ago now, 50 days ago from Egypt. So without the women and children, but the whole camp is here. So there's in the millions, 
that are around this thing. And the trumpet was so loud that the people in the camp trembled. They were like, holy smoke, this is the God of Israel? And Moses brought the people of the camp. This is as they're on their way. Check this out. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. <laughs> That's how they stood at the foot of the mountain. Okay? Like I do waiting in line for a hot dog. <laughs> and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now, Mount Sinai, I love this, was completely in smoke. Remember, we talked about this. The Shekinah glory of God. It's daytime. The Shekinah glory, the cloud of the day, fire at night. We're in the daytime, therefore, it's a, it's a cloud. Now, Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord, notice all caps, therefore, it's the English translation of the Hebrew, Yahweh. Yahweh. You guys are good. Okay? Somebody's paying attention, taking notes. Yeah, this is Yahweh is what's being described here. Not Jehovah. There was no J in the dang language at this point. There's been no J's in any language up until about 600 years ago, 700 years ago. So this idea that Jehovah is the proper way to pronounce it is a bogus. No language has a J. Never has had. It's a new sound. Only a few centuries old. How do we know? Jose. <laughs> Call him Josie. Watch what happens. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because Yahweh descended upon it, notice, in fire. Oh! The day of Pentecost, Moses is going up, God comes down to meet his people and he comes down in fire. Imagine that. This is just awesome to me. And its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. Again, we just read these things and we say, what a wonderful experience that must have been for the people of Israel. <laughs> these people, their knees were knocking together. They were freaking out. Little kids running around, Wah, get us away! Like the, you know, the fireworks the other night? It never fails. You go to watch those fireworks and you get all the oohs and the ahs. And if you listen closely, there's the Because <laughs> there's always the kid that screams during the fireworks, freaks them right out. He's going to hate me for doing this. Let me tell you one. This guy about this tall has the same last name as me. His name's Travis. <laughs> that little guy freaked out for years. He would just quiver <laughs> at fireworks. I mean, just literally shake. I'm not kidding. I was there. <laughs> I'm telling the truth. I mean, he would just like... <laughs> and we're like, dude, really, it's just... Look, it's in the sky. It's not going to hurt you. But he freaked out. Of course, now he thinks he's big because he can stand there without freaking out. But if you watch him closely, you can see him go like this every time. <laughs> Just kidding. No, he's outgrowing that. But, but you see, no matter how fascinating, there's always that act of, there, there's that, that side of fear that's involved in that. And that's what's happening here. The whole mountain quaked greatly. So put yourself in this position. There's this thing. These trumpets are like, you know, you know, they're just, just and sadly, insanely loud. And we're going to see that they're going to get even louder. God is telling his people, I'm here and you need to understand. And there's this, this cloud, there's thunder and there's lightning and there's this stuff. And all of a sudden this fire shows up in the midst of all this. And then all of a sudden you're knocked off your feet because there's an earthquake taking place. Boy, when God shows up, he shows up. He's not no little piddly guy like is portrayed in our world. No. This is the God of the universe. And He ain't Allah. And He isn't anything else. He is God the Creator. Period. End of story. And what everybody, whatever anyone thinks of that is irrelevant. It doesn't change the fact. And someday soon, every person, including Lucifer himself, will stand before that God. And if you think this was freaking you, we're going to freak you out, trust me, that's going to be a rough day for a lot of people who have written him off and have created all these other means to try to replace him. He can't be replaced. He'll never be replaced. Well, we're so much smarter nowadays. I mean, we understand so much more. God is just a myth and he's just a crutch. You just showed how stupid you are by making that statement. A crutch? Christianity is a crutch? 
If Christianity is a crush, then why are we the ones that are always getting beat on? No, it's the people that, that, that have their other beliefs that beat on us. They're the ones with the crutch. It takes a man, it takes a woman to stand for Christ. No crutches allowed. That's what it is. So it's smoke, it, it ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. This is the first Pentecost. If you're these guys this day in that upper room, this is what you remember. See? Not some little Sunday school lesson. For them, it was real. I mean, they, they, were ancestors, they were descendants, I should say, of those that experienced this and had passed it on from generation to generation. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, holy cow! I always picture Chewbacca in Star Wars with that <laughs> on the Death Star when they're in that room and he's freaking out over there. Never mind. <laughs> Oh, the big hairy carpet. Anyway, and when the blast of the trumpet sounded louder and became louder and louder, Moses spoke. Now that's all, that's, did you catch that? So it's be like, what? <laughs> what? I can't hear you. It's like, Moses, really? Now you want to speak. But anyway, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain. And Moses went up. Now we read later, we don't have time to get into it today. We read later that the people got so scared. I mean, absolutely terrified. Ever wonder where the word uh, fear of God comes from? comes from this. They were in such fear and anguish over what they had experienced, not even really being in the presence of God, but seeing Him, even at this distance. Remember, they couldn't go up on the mountain. They had to stay back. And this was still affecting them. That later they're going to say to Moses, listen man, don't ever do that to us again. Okay? We're not going up on that mountain anymore. You go. <laughs> It's like the people of God are always like that. Yeah, you pastors, you guys go. The rest of us will just... That's what they wanted to do. They said, no, you go. In fact, whatever God tells you, you just come and tell us and we'll, we'll do it ourselves. And we'll, we'll, we'll do... I'm sorry. We'll do whatever the Lord tells us to do. Now, real quick like, why the Jews? This is always a question. Why did this happen for the Jews? There's a rabbinic tradition that says that God offered what was going to take place because what would follow this was the giving of the law. Okay? Obviously. There's a rabbinic tradition that says that God offered the law to each of the 70 nations from Genesis chapter 10. In other words, He offered the, the law, for those of you that are here with us on Wednesday nights, He offered the law to all of the descendants of Japheth. In other words, Europeans, you and I. He offered the law to all the descendants of Ham, the African nations. And he offered it to all the descendants of Shem, but only those that were in the line of Abraham would, would fully grasp it. And each of the nations turned it down. This is rabbinic tradition. Okay? Now, we don't, the scripture doesn't say this, so we're not going to make too much of this. But it is an interesting concept. Because the idea is that all of the nations said to God, well, okay, so your law, well, what do we have to do to obey your law? And God basically gave them a, a version of the Ten Commandments. And they said, well, no, you know, we, we don't want to do that. And that's why God gave it to the Jews. Now, you would expect that to come from rabbinic tradition. But it is an interesting concept, nonetheless. You know, because we got this idea that God selected Israel because he liked them better than everybody else. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. He just had to select someone and they were the ones. And the reason that I believe as well as others believe is because they told Moses, you go up on the mountain for us and whatever the Lord says, we will do. They didn't ask. They just said, you just tell us. They agreed to follow the law of God before they even knew what the law of God was. That's kind of significant. Now, they dorked out, as God expected them, because they're human beings. But the point is, as a nation, that's what they did. Because they were descendants of Abraham, who believed God, and it was therefore accredited to him as righteousness. So why is all this important? Because this encounter changed everything. 
Certainly the, the, the crucifixion, the death, the burial of Jesus changed everything. The resurrection was, was the master blow. I mean, it, it changed time as well as eternity. This day like that would do the same. Because on this particular day, God was doing something that would not shake Mount Sinai, it wouldn't even shake Mount Zion, but it would shake the world. Because what came out of Pentecost was the power of God to literally shake the world to its core and to shake it with the truth that Jesus Christ is the Lord. And His resurrection is the proof that He is Lord. He has set us free in His first coming and He will come and reign when He returns. This day changed everything. So it's more than a day in a room with clouds and lightning and fire appearing. It's a day that would change the course of history. It's a day that would continue to be played out even in 2014. June the, what are we on the 6th? June? July. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, July. Wow, okay, holy cow. July the 6th, just kidding. That day affected even this, and it will affect next year and the year after that until its mission is complete. Because the church is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Now let's close in prayer and we're going to get into the communion service here. Father, we thank you for this morning and just for these words and how this all plays into that upper room. It was in an upper room that you changed everything by telling them that there was going to be a new covenant. But this covenant would not be in stone. This covenant would be guaranteed on your life. This is a covenant that could not be broken, could not be changed. It was a covenant that would endure through time, but also into eternity. And so, Lord, as we turn our attention now towards the communion service, we pray, Father, that you would uh, 